Hello everyone and Namaskar. So today's podcast is a continuation of the reading of the book titled Anandamurti the Jamalpur Years. And this is a reading of the 24th chapter titled The Tiger's Grave. There is spiritual potential in all people. Some people have harnessed it. And these people are able to help other people to arouse it. Some people arouse it if they are in the company of those who have already awakened it. This is the importance of good company, satsanga. Your duty is to awaken yourself and help others to awaken. During the century before Baba's birth, the area north of the Jamalpur railway station was a dense forest that included the Karakpur hills and the valley beyond, an area inhabited only by wild animals and an occasional tantric yogi, drawn by the impenetrable solitude. After the establishment of the railway workshop in 1862, the British gradually began cutting into the forest as they expanded their facilities and cleared expansive meadows for their recreational pursuits. By the time India gained its independence in 1947, the open areas between the Railway Institute and the Karakpur Hills and Death Valley comprise hundreds of acres of spreading meadows, sprawling shade trees, a long curving reservoir, and numerous pathways that led up into the hills where one could find secluded vistas that afforded a spectacular view of the Munger Valley all the way to the River Ganges. In the middle of the open meadows, about a 30-minute walk from the main workshop, lay two graves spaced about 20 meters apart. In June 1864, a foreman from the railway workshop was out hunting when he ran into a tiger at the edge of the forest. He was able to get off a shot, but the tiger still mauled him. When his fellow workers sent out a search party the next morning, they found both him and the tiger dead. After the funeral services, they erected a small tomb for their fallen comrade at the spot of his death and buried the tiger nearby under an unmarked tomb. The Karakpur Hills and Death Valley had been Baba's private wilderness throughout his childhood. They provided him with the seclusion he needed for his spiritual pursuits. When he returned to Jamalpur after college to take a position in the railway workshop, he made it a habit to spend his evenings walking through the enchanted scenery of his younger days. He would cut across the meadows and fields towards the hills, then along the reservoir and past Death Valley, before turning back and completing the circuit. Weather permitting, he would leave the house at 7 or 7.30 and rarely return home before 10. Occasionally, an office colleague or a friend from his earlier days would join him. Something that became more frequent once Pranay and others took initiation. But in his first years back home, he would often walk alone, sometimes disappearing into the forest, as he had done when he was a boy. Typically, in the middle of his walk, Baba would stop and take rest on the tiger's grave, sitting and staring off into the vast night sky. Once he began gathering disciples around him, the mid-walk pause at the tiger's grave became a permanent fixture of his evenings. It was not uncommon for him to spend a couple hours there sitting and chatting, telling stories, giving spiritual instruction and demonstrations, and even dictating books by candlelight. When Mangal Bihari went on his first field walk, he was so overwhelmed by Baba's presence that he spent the entire time 
repeating silent prayers. O Baba, lead me to the right path, guide me to the light, help me to surrender. The next evening, when they were about to leave, Baba turned to him and said, Mangal Bihari, don't be in a prayerful mood. Be natural. It was as if a spell had been broken. From that moment on, Mangal Bihari felt the way the rest of the Margis felt when they went on field walk with Baba to the tiger's grave. He felt as if there was no distance between them as if he were walking and chatting under the open sky with his best friend and his father, enjoying the beauty of nature and the company of the one dearest to his heart. Baba would talk about everything the disciples could imagine and many things they couldn't, and they would cherish those memories as the most intimate of their lives. One evening. Madan and Harinder of Trimohan were alone with Baba on field walk. They were still teenagers at the time. Both of them had sneaked out of their houses to catch the train and come see Baba. While they were walking in the direction of the tiger's grave, Baba asked, What would you do if a tiger jumped out now and attacked us? Would you run? Or would you fight? Adan replied in a defiant tone, Baba, I will fight the tiger and I will kill it. I am a very good fighter. Years later, he would point out that he had been young and not very sensible at the time. Okay, Baba said. But what about Harinder? Baba, we are best friends, Harinder said. If he doesn't run, then how could I? We will give our lives to protect you. Only then could the tiger attack you. Baba patted them both on the shoulder and said, You are both very brave, and I love you very much. In the future, Ananda Marga will need your bravery. You are both my bhimas. Later, while they were sitting on the grave, Baba began discussing various aspects of astronomy. He pointed to one star and started describing both that star and the solar system it belonged to. As he was talking, they both stared wide-eyed as the sky gradually started descending lower and lower. When it reached the level of the palm trees, they became frightened and grabbed Baba. Baba, get down, get down, they shouted. When Baba asked him what was going on, They said, Baba, don't you see? The sky is falling. It will kill us. Baba smiled. Don't worry. Nothing will happen. He pointed once again towards the sky and started tracing slow circles with his finger. Gradually, the sky retraced its course until it was once again back where it belonged. Baba got up and told them that it was time to go to the station and catch their train. Otherwise, they might get a beating from their parents. When Madan told them that it was already so late, they would surely get a beating, Baba assured them that everything would be okay. He accompanied them to the station and saw them off. When they got home, they were able to sneak back into their bedrooms without their parents ever knowing that they had been gone. One day on field walk, Dr. Bishwanath Singh told Baba that the Acharyas were having difficulties in Prachar for two principal reasons. One was the rule that people had to follow Yama Niyama. The other was that it was so difficult to have Baba's darshan. First, People have to take initiation, and then they have to practice sadhana for some time before they are allowed to see you. During DMC, they have to get a gate pass. There are so many rules and regulations that many people are hesitant to take initiation. 
even though they are impressed with the ideology. Can't you relax these restrictions a little? If you did, then many more people would join Ananda Marga. Baba laughed softly and said, It's an interesting idea, Bishwanath. Let me think about it. A few days later, Bishwanath was sitting on the tiger's grave with several other disciples when Baba brought up the subject. Bishwanath, the other day, you said that there are two reasons why many people are not joining Ananda Marga. First, because they have to follow Yama Niyama. And second, because there are so many rules and regulations they have to follow before they can see me. Is it not? Now I will give you your answer. As to the second question, there are reasons why I don't disclose myself in public. One reason is that if too many people know me for who I am, then it will make it difficult for me to do my work. Another is that when I appear as Guru in DMC, you people become abnormal. You know this. Why does it happen? Because when you come in contact with me, your Kundalini gets awakened. For sadhakas who are doing sadhana, this is fine. There is no adverse reaction. But if people are not doing sadhana, it could cause them to become mentally imbalanced or even physically ill. Would you be able to look after them if this happened and make them normal? Would it be proper for me to allow that to happen? As to your first question, removing the restrictions of following Yama Niyama, well, you see, I'm not a magician. At present, the greatest magician in India is P.C. Sorkar. It is his job to show magic. I am a normal human being. The only magic I can perform is to turn bad people into good people, to make them walk the path of righteousness and make them human beings in the real sense. Would this be possible if people didn't follow Yama Niyama? Ananda Marga is a man-making mission. If I removed Yama Niyama, then millions of people in India might join. But what good would it do? I want to create human beings, not a religion. Do you know what happens to people when they don't follow Yama Niyama? Baba touched Bishwanath between the eyebrows and asked him to describe what he was seeing. Baba, I see a market area, a road with shops on both sides. Look a little farther. Down the road, I can see a temple. Look closer. Do you recognize the area? Yes, now I recognize it. It is the Bishwanath Temple in Baranasi. What else do you see? Outside the temple, there is a crowd of people standing in a line. They appear to be beggars. Do you see two lepers sitting in the midst of them? Yes, Baba. One was a foreigner in his previous life, and the other was a commissioner. Do you know why they have become beggars in this life? Because they didn't follow Yama and Yama. Look again and describe what you see. Again, Baba pressed his thumb to Bishwanath's Trikuti. Bishwanath started describing a well-dressed man in black robes and a powdered wig sitting in a courtroom during a trial. Yes, one of these lepers was a judge in England in his past life, Baba continued. But he was a corrupt judge who accepted bribes and put innocent people in jail. Now he is a beggar and a leper as a consequence of his actions. So, do you still want me to relax the restrictions of Yama Niyama? I want to create a Sadbipra society, and that is impossible without Yama Niyama. I put my emphasis on quality, not quantity. Don't worry. The work that needs to be done will be done at the proper time. A few months after the introduction of Prout, Baidyanath was sitting on the tiger's grave with Baba and a few other Margis discussing the new philosophy. When he questioned Baba whether or not 
it would really be possible to establish a Sadbipra society one day. Baba assured him it would, as long as he and his fellow Margis worked selflessly toward that end. Then he expressed another doubt that had been in his mind for some time. Baba, some people say that you rehearse with Dasarath before the demonstrations, that you go over what he will say and what you will say. They say he doesn't actually see anything. Why are you speaking such nonsense? It is very easy to get angry, Baba. Very well, then. I will keep quiet. But it doesn't change what some people are thinking or saying. Okay, then. Do you want to see a demonstration for yourself? I will do a demonstration on you. Baba told Bedinath to sit directly in front of him and begin performing his meditation. Bedinath did as instructed. But he kept his hands on Baba's feet, worried that Baba might deceive him and leave while he had his eyes closed. After five minutes, Baba asked him to open his eyes, look at the moon, and describe what you see. Baba, it is the sun, he exclaimed, astonished to see the sun blazing in the night sky. No, you are mistaken. Look again. He looked again and saw the sun blazing even brighter, illuminating the sky as if it were midday instead of nearly ten at night. No, Baba insisted once again, you are mistaking the moon for the sun. Here is the sun. Baba raised his hand, and Baidyanath saw the sun shining in Baba's palm, even brighter than when he had seen in the sky. He began to lose consciousness of his surroundings. As he did, he saw the entire solar system revolving around the sun, planet by planet with the universe as a backdrop. While he was lost in this ecstatic vision, he heard Baba's voice echoing through the heavens. Do you know what will happen if I displace the sun? All the planets will crash and be destroyed. The balance of the universe will be lost. Do you want me to do that demonstration? No, Baba, no, Bedinath cried, suddenly overcome by fear. At that moment, the vision started to recede. When he regained consciousness of his surroundings, Baba put down his hand. The other Margis were looking on speechless. That was the end of Bedinath's doubts about his guru. A few days later, Baba initiated him into Kapalik Sadhana. Once, Chandra Shekhar, at that time a student of engineering, was sitting on the grave with Baba, massaging the master's feet and gazing up at his face. He was scarcely paying attention to the conversation going on between Baba and the other three disciples who were sitting there. Baba changed his subject to yoga therapy and began to describe a course of treatment for those who had problems passing urine or stool. Chandrasekhar started paying closer attention since he had been suffering from the same problem and had been reluctant to ask Baba about it. He did his best to memorize what Baba was saying. When Baba finished, he looked at Chandra Shekhar and told him that his mother was putting onion in his food without his knowledge. For this reason, his spiritual practice was hampered. Then Baba laid his hand on Chandra Shekhar's head. At that moment, Chandra Shekhar later recounted, All tension went out of my mind. My mind became lighter and lighter, and I started to feel blessed. Whatever feeling of distance I felt from Baba, either due to my samskara or for some other reason, disappeared. Then Baba surprised him by saying, Chandra Shekhar, I have visited your house. You should ask your mother about it. Now you are tired. Enough massage. Baba took Chandra Shekhar's hands in his and started massaging them until it was time for them to leave. Inspiring ecstatic feelings in his speechless disciple. The next morning, 
Chandrasekhar asked his mother if she had secretly been adding onion to his vegetables. At first she denied it, but after he pressed a point, she admitted that since he had refused to eat onions, she had started making an onion paste and adding it to the vegetables so that he wouldn't notice. But how did you find out, she asked. Baba told me last night on field walk. He also told me that he has visited our house and that I should ask you about it. His mother appeared startled by the comment. No, your Baba never came here. For a few moments she was silent. Something was obviously troubling her. Then she said, Something strange happened last night. It was about 8 or 8.30 in the evening. I was standing in the yard when I looked up and saw a man with spectacles standing on the roof. It was a shock. I ran across to the neighbor's house and shouted to ask him to check from the upper story window to see who was on the roof. I thought it might be a thief, but by that time, the man had vanished. Chandrasekhar went into his room and came back to the kitchen with a photograph of Baba in a standing pose. Is this the person you saw on the roof? Yes, that's the person I saw. His mother replied in a momentary state of confusion. This is my Baba, my Guru Deva. At the same time, that he was sitting in the field with me and talking, he appeared to you on our roof. His mother folded her hands to her chest and bowed before the photo. Shortly afterward, she took initiation and gave up eating onions herself. Although field walks with Baba were among the most intimate moments that the disciples spent with him, there was no escape from the disciplinarian side of the Tantra Guru. Surendra recalled, sitting on the tiger's grave one evening with Baba. Among the disciples present was a university professor from Bhagalpur. During the course of the conversation, Baba asked him one by one how their meditation was going. When it came the professor's turn, he replied that it was going fine. Baba became furious. You scoundrel, do you think my eyes are limited? Only to Jamalpur? These eyes are behind every atom and every molecule of the universe. They are watching everything. Do you want me to tell these Margis here what you have done? Should I reveal the contents of the letter in your pocket? Should I tell them where you told your family you were going? And where you actually went? And what you did there? The professor shuddered, visibly frightened. He began pleading with Baba to forgive him. Are you ready to accept punishment then? Baba asked him to lick the sandals of each Margi present and then rub his nose on the ground. The professor was still in a state of shock when Baba left for home with a separate group of disciples who were waiting to accompany him back. On another occasion, a rich businessman from Gorakhpur, named Hanuman Prasad, went for his first walk with Baba. Accompanying them was his acharya, Sachidananda, along with Ramakanta and a couple of other margis. As they were entering the field, they came to a large puddle on the road, several inches deep, left there by a recent downpour. Baba started to take off his shoes preparing to wade across in his bare feet. But Hanuman Prasad insisted that Baba keep his shoes on. Baba, I will carry you across, he said. And indeed, Hanuman was a strong, well-built man who looked as if he could carry several Babas on his broad shoulders. But Baba replied that it would not be necessary. The water is not deep, he told him. I won't have any problem crossing. But Hanuman continued to insist, and finally Baba agreed. Hanuman squatted down and asked Baba to place a leg over his shoulder. Then he tried to straighten up and lift Baba onto his neck. 
But try as he might, he was unable to lift Baba even a single inch, much to his embarrassment. Later, he told the other Margies that he had felt as if he had almost died from the weight of Baba's leg, as if Baba had placed the weight of three worlds on his back. When the Margis reached the tiger's grave, Baba asked Hanuman where he was from and what he did. He told Baba that he worked for the Gita Press in Gorakhpur and that he hoped to use his ties with the Gita Press to help Ananda Marga, as well as to find a path to Nirvakalpa Samadhi. It is good that you publish books that help people learn about Dharma, Baba said. But as the conversation continued, Baba started asking more and more pointed questions as to whether he actually followed the tenets of the Gita. Quoting one of the Gita's famous verses that referred to promoting the welfare of society and other living beings. As Hanuman grew more and more uncomfortable under Baba's scrutiny, Baba began to reveal examples of his misconduct telling the date and place of his misdeeds for all to hear. You are an imposter, Baba said in a scathing tone. You cheat people out of their money while you hide behind a veil of dharma. With such despicable conduct, Nirvakalpa Samadhi is far beyond your reach. Baba turned to Sachidananda. You brought him here. You were thinking that if this man donated some of his wealth, it would benefit the mission. But I tell you, you should not mix business with spirituality. What can such a man give the mission when the elements provide everything it needs? Just look. Look at the hills. Baba pointed to the eastern hills. The Margis turned in unison and saw the hills transformed into gold, shining brilliantly under the night sky. Baba started berating Hanuman in a loud voice. Do you know whose hills these are? These are Baba's hills. Do you think you can purchase me with your money? Do you think you can purchase spirituality? Hanuman started weeping and begging Baba's forgiveness. Baba softened his tone. Will you make me a promise that from now on you will follow the principles of Yama Niyama? With all strictness. Yes, Baba. Very well then. Practice your sadhana sincerely and follow Yama Niyama. If you can do that, you will get everything you are hoping for. By 1960, the number of people wanting to go on field walk each day had increased to the point that they had to be divided into three groups, with a maximum of four in each group. One group would accompany Baba to the tiger's grave, where a second group would be waiting for him. The third group would come later to accompany Baba back to his house. One evening, Asim was in the second group, along with his friend, Bana, Acharya Pashupati, and a young initiate of Pashupatis. After the first group had turned back, Baba sat on the tiger's grave with the four devotees and turned his attention to Pashupati's initiate. Do you repent for your wrong deeds? He asked. The boy insisted that he hadn't committed any misdeeds. Baba's mood turned grave. Who has brought him here? Pashupati folded his hands to his chest and said in a humble voice that he had brought him. Why did you bring him? Baba asked, What is the reason? Pashupati remained silent. Baba turned his attention back to the boy and started recounting his misdeeds, citing the date, time, and place of each. After Baba had described four or five sordid incidents, the boy fell to the ground in front of Baba, begging Baba to save him. Baba was silent for a minute or two. Then he asked the boy to sit in front of him. Baba extended his legs. Press my feet against your chest. The boy did so. After a few moments, 
Baba asked, Is your chest pain gone? Yes, Baba, the boy replied, tears streaming down his face. Baba addressed the Margis. Both of this boy's lungs were filled with water. He was in the third stage of tuberculosis, and his doctors had given up hope. At this point, he met his Acharya, who told him that if he learned meditation and went to Baba, Baba could cure him. He has come here, hoping to get his TB cured, but he has been trying to hide the fact from me. Baba looked at the boy. Isn't it so? Yes, Baba, the boy replied, sobbing even more loudly. How many chapatis did you eat the night before last? You have forgotten. Well, I remember. I know each and every pore of your body. Whatever happens in this world takes place in front of my eyes, and you are trying to hide from me. The boy continued weeping. Baba softened his tone. Now, now, don't cry. Come and sit closer. The boy sat just beside Baba, and Baba started patting him on his back. Your TB is cured now. Tell your doctor that you don't have any more problems. From now on, you are a new man. Forget the past. Just look ahead. Promise me that from today on, you will be a new and ideal person and serve the society. The boy promised, and Baba blessed him. No one should waste time thinking about the past. Look toward the Lord and move ahead. You will reach your goal. When it was time for Baba to return back, he joined the third group, which was waiting a short distance away. As they started walking back toward town, Asim's group followed them, close enough to hear the conversation. One of the devotees in the third group was a police officer. At one point, he turned to Baba and said, Baba, we must be strong moralists. The cardinal moral principles should be propagated everywhere. Yes, you are right, Baba said. The officer continued in the same vein for several minutes more. Asim was impressed. What a strong moralist he must be, he thought. Suddenly Baba stopped beneath a tree that was towering over the roadside and asked the officer if he knew the meaning of the word asteya. Yes, Baba, the officer replied. It means not to steal from others. Tell me, is taking a bribe against asteya? Yes, Baba, it is. We shouldn't take bribes. Baba planted himself in front of him with both hands on his hips. Bring out the 62 rupees you have in your back pocket. Bring them out. The chagrined officer removed exactly 62 rupees from his back pocket. Baba turned to the rest of the margis and said, This man accepted a bribe of 100 rupees this morning. From this money, he took his meal and paid his train fare to come here. Now only 62 rupees are left, and he is talking about morality. Baba turned back to the officer. Spit on the ground and lick it with your tongue. Spit. The man spit and began to bend over. But Baba stopped him before he could carry out his order. Okay, okay, Baba said. Promise me that you will return the money to the person who gave it to you and that you will never again accept the bribe. The officer promised and Baba gave him his blessing. You will never have problems providing food and clothes for your family, he told him. If you ever find yourself in difficulty, come to me and I will help you. Baba started walking again towards his house, but he continued talking to the officer, who was weeping copiously. Don't think about the past, he told him. God has given you two eyes in the front of your head to look forward. Forget the past. You are a moralist now. Baba changed the subject and started inquiring about the welfare of his family, asking by name about his wife 
and each of his children. In the winter of 1959, Ramaswarath decided to spend his Deepavali vacation in Jamalpur. As he was traveling there by train, he was thinking about the Margi's claim that Baba was Antaryami, all-knowing and all-seeing. I won't believe it without proof, he thought. First, I will have to put the master to the test. If he passes the test, then and only then will I accept him as Antaryami. Knowing that the list for field walk was always full, he told Baba mentally that if he really were all-knowing, then he should invite him to go alone with him on field walk that evening. When his train arrived, he went straight to Baba's quarters in Rampur Colony. Several Margis were already waiting under the neem tree, a short distance from Baba's house, to go on field walk. A short while later, Baba came out. He spent a few minutes talking with the Margis. Then, to Ramaswara's stunned surprise, he announced that only Ramaswarath would accompany him on walk that evening. As they began walking toward the field, Ramaswarath followed closely behind Baba, thrilled to be alone with his guru, but angry with himself for having doubted him. It took several requests from Baba before he began walking side by side with him. They headed toward the main bridge, crossed the railway tracks, and soon reached the old church. At that moment, a black dog appeared. Ramaswarath, Baba said, stay between me and the dog. Do not, under any circumstances, let him touch my body. Ramaswarath did as he was told, fending off the dog whenever he made an effort to approach the master. When they reached the tiger's grave, the dog jumped on the tomb with them. Shoo it off, Baba said, motioning with his hand. Ramaswarath pushed it off the grave, and the dog sat on the ground, a few paces away. Do you know this dog, Baba asked. No, Baba. He was a human being in his past life. He used to pose as a religious man, but actually he was a man of bad character. He committed some very serious misdeeds. This animal body is his punishment for those misdeeds. The reason I told you not to let him touch me is that if he were able to, then he would die immediately and get a human body in his next life. I can't allow that. He is still under punishment for four more years, according to cosmic law. A little while later, Baba added, despite having a dog's body, he still has a human mind. That's how he was able to recognize me. He also recognized Dasarath, since he was Dasarath's relative in that past life. Whenever Dasarath and I go out walking, he comes. But Dasarath is not with us, Ramaswarath pointed out. Go toward the road a little ways. You'll see Dasarath coming. Go and see. He won't move. Ramaswarath got up and started walking toward the road. After a minute or two, he saw Dasarath approaching. As they walked back toward the grave, he asked Dasarath about the dog. Dasarath related that the dog had been following him and Baba for the past few days. Baba had told him to pet it, but not to allow it to touch Baba's body. When he had asked why, Baba had told him who the dog had been in its past life. A few days later, the dog was again present at the tiger's grave with Baba, Dasarath, and several others. This time, the Margis pleaded with Baba to release the dog from its bondage. Baba argued that it would not be proper. The dog had to undergo the reaction of its actions. Yet after a short time, Baba relented. He closed his eyes for a few moments. Suddenly the dog, which had been sitting nearby, stood up and then killed over dead. Professor Suresh Mandal's stomach problems had been disturbing his peace of mind for some time. 
early in 1960, he finally consulted a doctor in Hasaribag about it. The doctor, who happened to be a Margi, also named Suresh, told him that there was no use taking medicine if he wanted to cure his stomach problems and find peace of mind. He would do better to adopt the meditation and yoga practices of Ananda Marga. The doctor referred him to Shiva Shankar Banerjee, then living in Hasaribag, and assured him he would find what he was looking for. Suresh was skeptical, but he was ready to take the chance that it might work. He took the precaution, however, of informing Shiva Shankar that he was a communist and a non-believer. It doesn't matter, Shiva Shankar told him. All that matters is whether or not you do the practice sincerely. Relieved that belief was not a prerequisite, Suresh did his practice sincerely. Within a few months, his stomach problems cleared up and he started finding the peace of mind he had been looking for. This induced him to begin reading Baba's books. He was greatly impressed by the philosophy. But when he asked Shiva Shankar about Baba's educational qualification, he was surprised to hear that Baba had only passed ISC and was working as an accountant in the Jamalpur Railway Workshop. Nevertheless, he became a willing traveler when Shiva Shankar told him that it was time for him to go to Jamalpur to have Baba's darshan. When Suresh arrived in Jamalpur with his letter of introduction from Shiva Shankar, Pranay gave him permission to go to the field that evening, but only after answering three questions successfully. Did he keep the top knot? Did he wear the sacred thread? Did he believe in idol worship? Suresh, as a self-respecting communist, answered no to all three questions, thus successfully passing Pranay's exam. An acharya brought him to the tiger's grave, where Baba was sitting with a small group of disciples. After Suresh sat down, Baba asked him if he did his meditation twice a day regularly. Yes, Baba, I do, at least when I am in Hasaribag. I find it difficult to do when I am out of town. Do you take your food regularly? Baba asked in a trenchant tone. Do you do your other necessary daily duties regularly? God has given you this human body to do sadhana. This is the main purpose of your life. You do all your other duties, but you don't do the most important one. Do 25 tik tiks. When Suresh had finished the tik tiks, Baba asked him to sit beside him. He patted him on the head and said some words of spiritual encouragement. Then he asked him to explain the meaning of a steya. Suresh could not. Then tell me the meaning of a parigraha. Again, Suresh didn't know. What? You don't know the meaning of a parigraha? What is your educational qualification? MSc. MSc? You have such a big degree and you don't know the meaning of Asteya. I have only an ISC. The next morning was New Year's Day. Suresh was still smarting from the blow to his ego. When Baba came to the Jagrati for General Darshan, he asked Dasarath to give a talk. But Dasarath begged to be excused. He requested Baba to give his usual discourse. Okay, Baba said. Then let the topic be Asteya, non-stealing. Asteya is of two types. One is physical Asteya, where you physically steal some material object. This is visible to other people's eyes, and if you get caught, the law may punish you. The other type of stealing is mental stealing. The law cannot punish you for this. Baba turned his attention to Suresh, who was sitting in the front. Am I right, Suresh? Suppose a person works in a government college, and in a warehouse under his supervision, there is a stock of goods that has been sitting there for several years, seemingly forgotten. So he thinks to himself, 
Better he sell those goods and pocket the money. No one will notice. If this idea comes to his mind, is it not mental stealing? Suresh hung his head. He had indeed been thinking to sell such a stock that had been lying in his warehouse for ages. After Baba left for his residence, Suresh sat by himself, thinking how fortunate he was to have found such a guru. A worldly father would have only scolded him had he actually done the deed. But his spiritual father had pointed out the error in his thoughts in order to guide him down the proper path. He thought about his communist beliefs and realized that only spirituality could make a true human being. If there could only be a blending between the ideals of communism and the spirituality of Ananda Marga, he thought. How nice it would be. It could lead to the formation of an ideal human society. In the evening, Baba returned to the Jagrati for General Darshan. During his discourse, Baba pointed to Suresh and said, Professor Suresh of Hasaribagh has been sitting here thinking that a happy synchronization between communism and Ananda Marga will lead to the formation of an ideal human society. But I say that communism fosters the suppression of human thought and can only lead to disaster. Suppose a driver is driving on a road that is full of pits, but he is unaware of them. Chances are he will meet with an accident. But if he knows the road, then he will be conscious of the holes and he will avoid them. In Ananda Marga, the pitfalls in the road are well known, so such accidents can be avoided. But in communism, the lack of understanding of the human being's spiritual nature is a recipe for disaster. Baba went on to analyze some of the problems that Russian communism had faced during the time of Stalin due to the inherent defects in the system. Remember, Suresh, he said, do not keep your feet in two different boats. Otherwise, you are sure to drown. If you struggle against injustice, and if at the same time you perform your sadhana and walk the path of morality, then you can be sure that I will always be with you. You will have my blessings, and victory will be yours. When Suresh returned to Hasaribagh, he informed the school administration of the neglected stock in the warehouse, and it was soon disposed of. By then, he had been introduced to Prout, and his days as a communist were behind him. When Rajnath Pandey, then a college student, went on his first field walk, he was in the group selected to accompany Baba from his house to the tiger's grave. He followed Pranay's instructions and went to Baba's house, where he found a group of government officers waiting for the master, a group that included Nagina and Ram Bahadur. When Baba came out and the Margis did Pranam, they noticed a beautiful fragrance emanating from his body. Baba began walking with his habitual speed, and the Margis had difficulty keeping up sometimes losing sight of him in the dark. Whenever this happened, Baba would stop briefly and call out his location. When they approached the bridge, several of the Margis, including Rashnath, had fallen behind again. They began talking about the fragrance that was coming from Baba's body. When they caught up again, Baba said, What conspiracy were you hatching back there? They told him about the scent. I don't use any scent, Baba said. It must be coming from you. No, Baba, it's coming from you. Okay, then. Tell me what kind of fragrance you smell. Each of them ventured a guess, but no one could correctly identify the scent. Baba pointed to Rashnath. If you want to know what fragrance it is, 
then you have to ask the youngest member of the group. Rashanath stepped forward, and Baba said, I will put my finger on your crown chakra. After ten seconds, you will see a bud, but you will not recognize the flower. After fifteen seconds, it will begin to blossom. And after forty-five seconds, you will be able to name it. As soon as you identify the flower, I will remove my finger. If I keep my finger there any longer, then your attention will be diverted. So I will only give you 45 seconds. By this time, they were standing on the railway bridge. Baba put his finger on Rajnath's head. Immediately, Rajnath saw a bud appear. Gradually, the bud started to blossom until it became a fully bloomed flower. When the stipulated time had passed, Baba asked him to name the flower. A lotus, Baba. What color? White. Yes, I am very fond of the white lotus. The fragrance you smell is the scent of the white lotus when it is fully bloomed. I like it very much. When you learn the process of Dian, then you will understand the significance of the white lotus. They resume walking. Baba began talking about the botanical characteristics and history of the white lotus. The scent continued for the duration of the field walk, some two and a half hours. It was not uncommon for new initiates to test Baba in order to see if he was the guru they were looking for and the realized soul that everyone claimed he was. One evening, Kamalakanta was sitting on the tiger's grave with two other disciples when Baba suddenly sent them both on errands, one to convey a message to Pranay, the other to fetch paper, pen, and a candle from the Jagrati. Unexpectedly, finding himself alone with Baba in that solitary setting, Kamalakanta thought that this would be the perfect time to test his guru. If he truly is a Sadguru, he thought, then he should give me the realization of the presence of Paramatman. And if he is really omniscient, as everyone says he is, then there is no need for me to say anything. He should simply read my mind. Both were silent for a minute or two. Then Baba closed his eyes. Kamalakanta, what do you think would happen to a person who suddenly found himself with a crore of rupees in his hand? After a moment's thought, Kamalakanta said, Baba, he would probably go mad or even possibly die from the shock. Do you think that if Paramatman were present, he might be worth even more than a crore or rupees? Baba, he would be worth more than a thousand crores of rupees. I see. Now think about this. If an unprepared person suddenly got the realization of the presence of Paramatman, what would be his mental condition? He would become disturbed. He would go mad. I don't want anyone to go mad. Unless and until a person's reactive momenta are exhausted, he cannot achieve liberation. For this reason, I don't give that realization to sadhakas who are in the preliminary stages of their sadhana. Do more and more sadhana, then you will have your realization. Such tests were a favor Baba often returned. Once Baba was on field walk with Ram Naresh and several other margis. Among them was a recent initiate who had come from Ranchi. Baba asked him where his hometown was. He was from Baga near Betia, and then remarked that he seemed to be having problems with his fear propensity. No, Baba, he replied. There are only two things I am afraid of, snakes and mad dogs. Is that so? There is a malwa tree over there. Go and touch it, and then come back. The new initiate began walking toward the tree. 
Before he had advanced ten paces, a sudden storm arose. Lightning flash, followed by loud peals of thunder. Within moments, it grew so dark that Ram Naresh could barely make out Baba, though he was standing right beside him. The boy who had gone to touch the tree ran back and fell on the ground, shouting and begging for Baba to please save his life, while the electric storm raged all around him. Suddenly the storm ended, as abruptly as it had begun. What has happened to you, Baba asked the disciple, who was still whimpering on the ground. Why are you whimpering like this? What did you see that scared you so? Baba, as I was walking toward the tree, all of a sudden, the tree disappeared, and I was surrounded by a group of skeletons. It was terrifying. But you told me that you were only afraid of two things, snakes and mad dogs. There were neither snakes nor mad dogs. Then why did you get scared? The disciple kept silent. You should never boast. When you are asked something by your guru, answer simply and truthfully. You were proud. You should never allow pride to take root in your mind. Om Prakash Cuenca learned a similar lesson about pride when he went on his first field walk with Baba. A recent graduate in chemical engineering, Om Prakash had heard many stories about Baba from the other disciples in Madras. Nevertheless, he harbored the conviction in his mind that at least in the area of chemistry, he knew more than Baba. As they sat on the tiger's grave, Baba asked him about the various margis in Madras and how they were doing. When Baba asked him about his education, he felt a puff of pride as he told Baba about his degree. Is that so, Baba said. Very good. Then you should be able to teach me something about uranium isotopes. Om Prakash started explaining about the naturally occurring isotope U-238. No, 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 Baba said. I want to know about the fissionable isotopes U-233 and U-235. Unfortunately, Om Prakash knew very little about these isotopes. And what little he did know only seemed to make Baba grow more and more disappointed. But I can get that from the books of Narasimham, Rakshit, and Kapoor. You have a degree in chemical engineering. I want to learn something that I can't just get as easily from reading a book. Can't you teach me anything that is not in those books? Om Prakash did not know what to say. He remained silent, wondering what knowledge, if any, he had that could not be gleaned from books. You disappoint me, Baba continued. I thought you can teach me something. Baba then began explaining about uranium as an energy source and its high value when compared to coal, petroleum, and natural gas. He went on to describe in detail the beneficial properties of these isotopes. The fissionable rays of uranium can be used for constructive purposes as well as for destructive purposes, he said. Since you are all Ananda Margis, you should only use them for constructive purposes. Om Prakash assumed that Baba must have learned these details from some book that he had yet to read. In 1972, however, he was surprised to read in a newspaper article that some Canadian scientists had discovered some of the beneficial properties of the uranium isotopes that Baba had discussed nearly a decade earlier. It was only then that he realized that Baba could not have gotten that information from any book since it had not yet been discovered at the time. Thank you.